So today I'm going to work on this thing here. It's a tube tester. Picked this up locally. Don't know if it works, but before you plug something of this age in, you have to take it apart and have a close look at it and make sure it's all good. Because you never know what's happened to it in its past. You never know you've got wiring which is disintegrating because it's made out of rubber. You just don't know. So you need to sort of check these things before you plug them in. Now this is 110 volts, not 240 volts for me. So that's potentially problematic. And I was actually lucky enough that it came with this original manual and circuit diagram and all that sort of stuff and setups for the tubes with information all in here which is brilliant and it basically looks intact um, this knob is spinning on that shaft that one's going that one's okay so this knob's got a bit of an issue I think the shaft may be seized I'm not quite sure what's going on there it doesn't want to turn so that could be something you need to look at it could just be stiff but um, Let's see if I can get a screwdriver in here, carefully, without splitting the shaft open. Yeah, it will turn. Okay, it will turn. So it's not completely seized, but it is very stiff. Which is probably why it's stripped it out. Which is why the seller included some spare knobs with it. Well, some new knobs to go on it. Also, the intention was to put some new knobs on it. And never got around to it, and decided to sell it instead. And here is the plug. Two core looking slightly shady. <laughs> mm, no earthing obviously. But so it's 110 volts. So I have to be careful to make sure I don't exceed that. It's also got this little plug thing which goes on top of some of the tubes, little cap. Some tubes have that. Um, I'm not a tube guy, I'm not really into tube stuff. I've got almost no experience with tubes. I've done a little bit on a couple of testers like you can see in the back here, just there. You can just see it, or tip back slightly. That is tube based, that capacitor checker. It's one of the few things I've got which has got tubes in it, and I've refurbished that. Done a video about it if you haven't seen that. Look for it, you might find it interesting. Found some faults. It may be fine, it might be perfectly good inside, but we don't know until we open it up. So the meter moves, hope you can see it on there. The meter is not frozen, that's a good start. River the coil was burnt out and it doesn't move because someone's overloaded it. That's also possible, but yeah, we'll find out in time. Anyway, right now, let's get it opened up. You have to excuse the noise of the printer. If you can't hear the printer, great, I've succeeded. If you can hear the printer, then, um, sorry. Oh, it's just finished. Yeah, excellent. No more printer noise. It's a GTEC A20M, which I've had for a few years now. I haven't used it that much because I've been using the end of threes. But um, I needed a larger print surface and the end of three couldn't do it. This has got a bigger print bed on it, so I was able to use this for it. It's also a faster printer, but it's also considerably noisier. The end of three, you can almost have it running without even noticing it. It's my ones again. Well, it's not full of cockroaches or anything, that's good. <laughs> you never quite know what you're going to get when it things up. Look at that meter, interesting. Cool. It's all exposed, easy to clean. Not much to it. Might just be a case of giving it a good clean and powering it up and freeing the switches up a little bit. This one's got some oxidisation on it. Interesting. See that's looking a bit crusty there. Um, it's the only bit it seems to be. So it's a bit curious. The rest of it looks basically okay. Let's check the circuit diagram see if it makes any sense. To the short indicator. Yes. So yes it is a capacitor. So this capacitor here. There's that bulb which I'm looking at here. It's a neon I'm thinking. 1.5 mega across it. Yes there is. Well, there's a capacitor, well, there's a resistor across it, I'm sure it's 1.5 meg. And there's the capacitor there, which is looking rather unhealthy. This looks going to be fairly straightforward to sort out. So I'm cleaning the switches first, and just to the basic, like, mechanical maintenance kind of stuff. A bit of cleaner in this pot as well, just clean things up. And these switches here, obviously, is only cleaning as well. So there's quite a bit of corrosion evident on this switch here. There's lots of corrosion in this area here. See, so it's all quite corroded on those two. This one's not so bad. Maybe it's something to the materials I've used. Maybe one's got better zinc plating on it. But, yeah. They're not all moving okay. They're not jammed or anything. But is that rather ugly capacitor which you have to do something with. So let's just start to saturate your switches because they're all going to need it. They're all really old and it's probably not the best thing to have it saturating into the, uh, the phenolic that's on them. But, uh, well, so be it. <laughs> Now this is a pot, so you can't use this stuff on the pot. I have to use the proper pot stuff for it. So we'll play switches there. 
I mean, the switches may not even be dirty, maybe be fine, but no, I'm giving it a clean. How old is this thing? This is, uh, the diagram says 1960. So 1960. These are actually freeing up a lot, so these left two feel a lot smoother now. Before they're feeling a bit rough, then they feel really nice. The right hand one's still feeling a bit rough. Might get some more in there. Let's try and give this switch a clean, which is going to be a problem because this knob is, you know, useless. <laughs> um, let's do the other one first. So you get to the other side too, spray both sides of the switch. It should also work its way down the shaft a little bit too and uh, hold lubricate the shaft. So this one here does move. Strangely, the one which has got the corrosion on it moves fine. And the one that doesn't have corrosion is the one that's stiff. Now let's look and see if they're springing up like they should be. When the contact goes underneath, they should move upwards. And make sure they're actually lifting. Yep. Yep, they're all lifting. So as this goes around, it's definitely making contact with each one of those properly because they're all lifting up a little bit. So that's all good. This one's a bit harder. Now, can I pull the knob off this one? I can. And we'll stick on this one. Right. Yeah, it's definitely stiffer. And what I might do then, actually, is spray some on this side as well. On this side, so it works its way through the shafts. Yeah, this one's definitely. Yeah, that's that's even damaging this knob. That one, that. I thought that slipped in once, so I don't want to do that. Let me know get a different knob. So looking at the shaft on this, it actually looks like someone's had pliers or something on it and actually stripped off some of the knurling, so it's actually damaged. It's not as pronounced as it is on this switch. That could be part of the problem why it's stripping out the uh, knobs, because these are quite stiff, between the knurling being damaged as well. No, it's stripped again. So, no. So I've shimmed the slot inside the switch with a nut. There's actually one from one of these toggle switches, right, because I've got a few spare nuts and stuff around here from switches that have failed in the past and you replace them and then you got spare bits. So I took one of those nuts and I squashed it flat and as I was almost there some bits broke off it but it's fine because the bits that are left still fit inside that slot. So then I was able to use that as a shim to stop the slot, stop the slot, stop the slot from closing up as I do the grub screw up in here. Well it's not your grub screw, it's actually a slot, a slotted screw. That seems to be holding I don't trust it completely, but it seems to be holding. So I managed to loosen off this spring on here to make it easier to turn. So that got better. But then, just after that, this disc moved. And it's now actually dislodged. So it's like, hmm. This, um, this phenolic is actually cracked anyway. So the switch is already no good. So I was going to replace this switch with a new one. But I've just noticed something. This switch is not a normally open switch, it's a normally closed switch. All these connections join together unless one is selected. Uh, it doesn't work the way I thought, so the switches I've purchased won't work either. I haven't come across a switch like this before, I don't think. Not one which is this configuration. Um, yeah, that's a problem. I need to rethink this now. So seeing as the switches I've got won't work, I've had a look at the diagrams in here and it does kind of need to work the way it's set up. I'll see if I can maybe I could adapt it and just change the switch and rewire it somehow, but it it's too complicated. I need to have like a multi-level switch to do that. You could have done that, but it would have been a pain. It's doable, not impossible. Anyway, so I've glued the switch back together. Then what I've I suddenly barely hold it, I'm really not happy with it. So I've got my hot metal glue gun here as well and I'm literally just going to glue the top here together across the crack and hopefully I can get the thing to stay together I might even be able to try and stick a cable tie around the outside to provide some extra tension around the outside of it to help hold it closed as well it's not great I'm really not happy about it but it's uh, it's what I can do right now um, but yeah, so now I'm just going to stick some hot metal glue in it as well just to provide some extra rigidity and support and it's not great but that's what I'm going to be doing I'm really not happy about the whole situation 
but sometimes you just have to make do with what you can actually manage. In this situation, putting a blob of glue across here to add some support across the joint and to help hold it together is basically going to be the limit of what I think I can do. So, um, yeah, it's, it's messy and it ain't good. <laughs> it really isn't good, but it's uh, a solution I've currently got. And maybe if I can find a right switch for it one day, I'll replace it and do a proper job of it. But right now, that's not looking like it's going to happen. So, for now, I'm just going to glove all this up with hot glue, just give it something to key into, and try and hopefully have the thing stay in one piece. That's something. I'm going to try and stick a cable tie around the outside as well to help hold it together too. As I get as much reinforcement as I can to hopefully prevent it falling apart. Well, it's done. Am I happy with it? Absolutely not. It looks horrendous. <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah, I'm not happy with it, but it won't fall apart. And that's the main thing, I suppose. And if I find a suitable switch in the future, I will replace it. But right now, I haven't found one. If I find one, then great. If you know one, get a switch like this. Well, it's got a common pole which goes to one connection only, and the rest will connect together in another state. So they're all linked together, and the other one there is one that's getting common through. So if anyone knows where you can get that sort of switch, let me know, because I would like to replace it. This is a temporary thing, if I can. If I can. But yeah, it ain't great. Well, let's check these resistors that are in here. I'm not quite sure what values it's actually supposed to be. So I want to see what they're actually reading right now, if I can get hold of them. Get a good connection. So 1.8k. 8.7 mega ohm, is it? I don't know. I have to look at these diagrams, see what we've got. So off the switches we have a 470 ohms and a 2k. I think this one here is supposed to be a 2k. It looks that way. And the one off the bottom here is supposed to be a 470 ohm. And it's not. So, yeah. <laughs> 2K, 478, I'm definitely not getting that. Let's look at these again. A probe on here. Probe on there. Getting 8 meg. Probe directly onto the resistor. 8 meg. We're well, supposed to be a 478. And this other one here, like I said, is supposed to be a 2K. 1.8. It's reading lower. Let's try changing switches around, make sure there's no other circuitry affecting things, it could be. So that's now isolated from that switch. 1.83k. That one's probably close enough. But I think the uh, 470 ohm is not in a very good place. So I've definitely got one resistor which is definitely really, really wrong. So over here we've got another capacitor, well a capacitor, it's supposed to be a 0 0.01, so 10 nanofarad. And also got a 1.5 meg resistor. So let's measure the resistor. 1.6. Yeah, close enough, probably. Okay, let's do the capacitor. So 0.3. That's also got this chalky stuff going on here. So I think that kind of needs replacing. I should probably replace that capacitor. So that resistor, that capacitor. Hopefully that's it. Alright, so the easy way of doing this is to actually cut these wires. So, because the resistor I'm going to put in is much smaller, so it's, was it half watt? I think it's a half watt resistor. I'm not actually sure what this one actually is rated for. The manual doesn't say what the wattage rating is. Hopefully half a watt, is, which is what I have, is big enough. So let's cut the lead off right here. That gives me an extension to hook up to on the other end. Now this end needs cutting off as well, but I'm going to try and cut it like this to try and cut the loop off the wire. Okay, that's what I'm trying to do here. Because I wrapped around. Now, did I get it or not? That's the question. Yes, I did. So there's probably a bit of wire still there. Yes, there is. It's came off with it. Great. Get rid of that. I've got some heat shrinker there. What I'm going to do is I'm going to flood this with solder already. 
Come on, get the solder in there. There we go. Attach your resistor. And once I get it in place, I'll come back and just touch it up again afterwards. Right now, I just want to get it in place. So I thread this under here. And you've got this original piece of sleeve. You want to slide over the original one as well. Why not? That's there. Okay. That's not too bad. You can probably put it a little bit tidier. This might be a bit hesitant to take for solder. Being old. Now this resistor is definitely not as robust as the original one that's in here. I'm just hoping it reaches the, uh, the requirements for the current handling. That's the bit I don't know about. Okay, that's that one done. Then we'll do the capacitor. All this original wiring is awfully messy to start with, so in itself it's not that great. off here because it's all wrapped around it's sort of a bit of a mess I have a suitable replacement here 400 volts rated <laughs> bit of a difference in size I don't know what the other one was completely unreadable so this is going to the neon as well so I need to kind of make sure <laughs> oh, the bezels fell apart um, but this is all going to be okay. If you shrink there, and I can just bring it around and keep it nice and short one in like that. That'll do. I will put a fresh shoulder on this as well once I've done it. So hopefully this neon actually works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. I have to do something with it instead. But that's fine. No worry about that when the time comes. I'm actually tempted to put some heat shrink over this. I think it's a good idea. Now yeah, I've got some heat shrink wrapped around that. Ready to go. It's massively big, but that's fine. I'm not sure it will shrink down enough or not, but I'm not really too worried about that. I just want to get something over it. And I will be trying to slide it down afterwards, but we'll see how we go. I think I've got a little bit sticking out the end here to try and solder onto. And I might actually shorten this one down some more this way. Okay, so that's those done. I've put the neon surround back in again. I'll actually put a bit of glue on it to hold it in because it just fell out before. I'm going to put some deoxy on these things just to try and help contacts. It's probably beneficial to do these again. I'm going to do this inside all the um, put deoxy inside all these holders as well because they're going to need it. Okay. We're we'll getting close to trying to power this thing up. I've got the sensitivity knob there, I've put some deoxid fader stuff in there, clean that up. Because being as old as it is, there's bound to be some uh, oxidisation build up on these. These are just straighteners, they don't need anything put in them. They're just there to straighten up the legs of the tubes when you put them in there. Okay, let's just do the fader on that one. Got power going along the cable, 110 volts going in. Haven't tried turning it on yet, we'll see what happens. Fingers crossed, nothing goes bang. That's drawing 3.8 watts. Where's that going? <laughs> now there's something happening on the meter here when I'm moving around, that's good. So the meters at least seems to be working. I've got no idea how this is supposed to be set up. Absolutely no idea. Okay, 3.8 watts. Now, the only thing I'm wondering about is those resistors, or that resistor I put in, whether it's any good or not, whether it's handling the power, even though there's nothing actually plugged into it yet. I think I might turn the power off again, just see if that resistor feels hot. So, power off. 
shit the resistor. Nah, nothing at all. Completely fine. So it's 3.8 watts going somewhere. It's obviously just the actual transformer absorbing that power. It's obviously a bit inefficient. So I need to get a tube and chuck it in here and see if it actually works. Well, I've got a tube here. It's a 6BN8. That is indeed in the book. So I need filament D. Triangle type. Socket number 1. And I also want selector number... Good question. 1, 6 and 8. Three different options for that. And I don't actually know what I'm doing with this, so we'll see. Sensitivity of 30. Okay, well, we'll get the tube. It's a new old stock tube. Now, we'll chuck it in the straightener first. Because this one here. Yeah, that plugs in, so it's all good. Right, chuck that in there. So you want socket number one. Put that in, like so. Rig spec short. I don't know what this. I don't understand what these do yet. Um, we'll turn it on as it is, and we'll see what happens. Power on. I can see some glowing. Needles coming up. Now this is a new old stock tube, so it should be good. I think it's a diode. Is it 6BN8? Is, it, is that a diode? I'm not sure actually what it is. Um, but it says diode's okay there. And sensitivity, adjust that. Okay, so it's that one. And the other options... Um, were position 6 and position 8. I guess it's got multiple segments in there or something. And sensitivity 100. Okay, we'll do that. Well, that's cup into good. Okay. And then down to 8. And it's say sensitivity 30, I think it did, actually. Yes, 30. I don't know, first one should have been 100. So 30 is in the good there. So on number 1, it should have actually been 100. I was reading that wrong. Yeah, it should be 100 on that one. So I think this is a good tube. It seems to work anyway, so excellent. The test is working. So something else I still want to do on this is to actually convert this thing to run off 240 volts. Now obviously it's got this rather dodgy two core mains cable which is rated 110 volts. I really don't like this. I would like to convert this to 240 volt because then I could just use it directly as is. Now I think the um, frequency, the 60 versus 50 hertz thing doesn't matter at all. It's purely voltage based so I think I need to try and see if I can find a way of stepping down the 240 down to 110 and go from there. Obviously I need a small little transformer of some kind which will fit inside this casing, ideally. Could be troublesome, we'll see. It would be nice to do that. If I can't, then I can't. It's just, it is what it is. I may look at potentially changing the cable and earthing the front panel, so at least got some kind of safety. I don't th think that would matter for the current functionality. I don't know, it may matter. But uh, yeah, I just don't like to use things which aren't earthed. It's never a good thing. So we've got another tube in here now. This is a 6AX4 GTB. I'm not sure what the GTB means. Um, I've already done a short test on this. So I've, I've read the instructions now. So I'm about to do a short test first. Go through the dial. Check for any indication on this lamp here. Which you can barely even see. I need to do something with that maybe. Maybe replace that neon. And then it will tell you which ones to disregard the indicator on so if you get an indicator coming on ones which doesn't say to disregard it then you've got a problem with the valve being shorted then you put it on the, the correct one you've got spec or special or regular position for testing special is indicated as an S under here and a selector otherwise you're doing them with regular and then you make sure this dial is set correctly let's put a sensitivity here I'll turn it on again there take a minute to warm up And then this will start to 
show up. Very good. There we go. Put it back to there. And uh, we're seeing about 65 there. Now I've noticed by changing the line voltage, this will change by a fair bit. I'm currently doing 110 volts coming in. If I do say 115 volts or so, yeah, that's 116 ish. That cut to almost 70. And if I cut to 120 volts, I'm just trying to get 120, yeah, 120 volts coming in, that's down about 72. So you don't really can see it on camera there, but that is very sensitive to line voltage. It's obviously it's affecting the transformer conversions. Filament voltage will be changing, so the, the emissions also change. Back on 110 volts, I'm getting back down to about 66 right now. So that's all right. Um, at least I know it's a good tube. Excellent. I can check tubes now. So I've also got this 6E5 tube which I'd like to test, but unfortunately it's not in the list. 6E5 isn't listed. I mean, it's probably still possible to test it, but it likely involve converting the pinouts, understanding how this thing actually works, and, well, yeah, that's not happening. <laughs> not today, anyway. I think that's all the testing I can do for now. I do have other valves around, but all buried away somewhere. But it seems to be working. That's the main thing. I, like I said, I still do want to convert this into 240 volt and get rid of this slightly dodgy cable. Yeah, we'll see if I can figure out a way of not doing that or not.